When the ground beneath us shakes, we crave stability. When the heavens open up and rain pours down, we run for shelter. When life presents us with vagueness, with flashes of possibility, we long for mastery. It's more instinct than anything else. But could it be that that instinct that we run to like moths to a flame is leading us astray, that it doesn't have our best interests at heart? Could it be that we're so worried about protecting and maintaining an acceptable image for the world that we forget to build something internally that's worth protecting? What if that shaking is what brings down the foundations that held us back? What if that rain washes away the limits of yesterday as we evolve into something more? And what if those flashes of possibility require of us not mastery, no, not yet, but a willingness to be the fool? And what if that willingness isn't an unfortunate dead end, but a beginning? In one of his lectures at the University of Toronto, Jordan Peterson said, if you are not willing to be a fool, you can't be a master. In the cycle that is self-discovery, that is growth, we have to at some point step into an arena that's foreign to us, that we don't yet understand. We have to be willing to operate with inadequate resources, trusting that you know they'll be picked up along the way. And that's a lot to take in. It's painful to know that others are going to have knowledge and skills and competencies that you won't that you'll willingly inject yourself into the bottom of some hierarchy with nothing more than aspirations. But that willingness is your vehicle. And what's clear is that everyone wants the moon, but very few people have the courage to start constructing that spaceship. Very few have the courage to be the student. That's why our inclination is to quit when we can't snap our fingers and magically be on our way, when we can't leap past that wandering around the unknowns. The reality is we have to fight, to scrap, to obtain that sense of belonging in a particular competency. And just talking about it brings me back. It's an obstacle that we all face. It's super real to me. I remember being featured on a, on a podcast where the host literally asked me, why should I listen to what you have to say, right? Like, who are you? Why, why are, are you road mapping your journey, right? I remember fighting for relevance in an area in which, you know, at the time I knew almost nothing about. And I love how Peterson articulates this battle. He says, at some point, you'll want to make a change and you'll feel like an imposter. And guess what? You are, but you have to be. You'll ultimately feel worse if you don't do it. That's imposter syndrome. Feeling like a stranger in your own body. And guess what? It's not wrong. It's just a beginning. I like explaining it like jumping into a cold pool. It feels uncomfortable at first. It feels out of place, but then things normalize. They become comfortable. And what's the other option? To fear that minute of, of discomfort and never jump in? It's what we need to tell ourselves when we want something, but the, the climb seems too steep, right? That climb is manageable. You'll acclimate. The adversary's pushing beyond that fear of starting anew, taking your limited understanding, bringing it to the base of that mountain, a new Goliath, and looking up with confidence. And the question is, can you be foolish enough to do that? And once you've made that ceiling your next floor, will you be foolish enough to do it again and again and again? And breaking through that fear, knowing that stumbling around for a period of time doesn't kill you, it's required. It's the inability to show weakness or appear vulnerable. That's what chips away at you for a lifetime. If you want more, immerse yourself in that cycle of mastery. Start at the bottom and ascend. And when you approach the top, separate yourself and find another ceiling to chase. Replant 
a seed. Play the role of the fool again. This is the formula for growth, for prosperity, for fulfillment. This is the pathway to anything of substance. You take your L's, you embrace your critics, you swallow your pride, and move towards a tomorrow that far exceeds today. As your reality changes, your perception changes, the company you keep changes, you'll start to see that what's around you is made by people who are willing to fail and fail often. Our world is one devised by those who could put pride on hold. By those who were humble enough to crawl through the unknown long before they ran anything who knew that before they played for any title or championship, they must first play the fool. I often ask myself, what differentiates those who wish for better outcomes and those who do something about it? What separates the dreaming from the progress and the wishing from the reality? Sure, life is complex. There are a lot of moving parts to understand. But I think this element is simple. Those who build things in life are willing to not only see a reality that hasn't yet materialized, but they also understand that in a world of no, they have to be the yes. They have to believe in their ability to drive towards finish lines that no one else sees. See, meaning cannot come to fruition without that discomfort. Or as Nietzsche put it, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. And that's just it. Most people see what is. Most people conform. They do not create. To change something means you have to be the metaphorical eagle amongst pigeons, flying above all that, everyone, everything else, superseding the limiting beliefs that shackle others to their one-dimensional realities. But most importantly, it means you can see. You can see what no one else can. You have line of sight to what no one else understands. See, in this world, no one walks up to you on the street puts their arm around you and says, hey kid, that dream, follow that, because I can tell you're going to do big things. No one says, hey, that business idea, you're going to thrive next year, I know it. That relationship, it's going to happen. That level of fitness, oh, I can see it already. Nope. People see what's right in front of them. And as it pertains to you and your world, your life, people are those pigeons. And so that leaves you with a choice. Do you accept that? Do you blend in, take the scraps you're allowed to consume, the crumbs laid out in front of you? Or do you step back and acknowledge that this is going to be tough? This is going to hurt. It's going to push me further as a person than I've ever been pushed. But you know what I get in return? That view. I get to live above the clouds with those who don't wait in line. No, they become the main attraction. They transform what is into what will be because the world, it has a way of ensuring that we really want what we say we do. Greatness in any area of life is reserved for those willing to carry forward when most would turn back. To build a bridge to something greater when most people point out that your bridge is not connected to anything, that it's a waste of time, it's trivial, useless, irrational. 
good, changing your life in the world around you has to be irrational. Taking the status quo and shaking it, saying I'm going to alter this landscape is irrational. But from irrationality comes the future. So when you feel like the world is against you, when you have an uphill battle to climb, when there are a million reasons for you to turn around, understand that this is nothing more than an indicator that you are right where you need to be, against the current, bringing something new to life. See, if it were easy, it would already exist. But changing your life, that makes you an architect of the unseen. So build on the days you want to build. On the days you don't build. When they understand, build. And when they assume you've altogether lost your mind, build. Sure, it's not easy, but it's worth it. And when tomorrow comes, and it looks a lot different from today, when you've grown, evolved, transformed, and you look back and don't even recognize the person you once were, that won't be because you listened to the chirping of the doubters and the naysayers. It won't be because when strangers told you to give up, you packed your bags and went home. No, it will be because you rose above all that. They saw empty space and you saw a world undiscovered. They saw your head in the clouds while you built those castles in the air. You were always on a trajectory to something greater. You didn't need to convince them. You needed to convince yourself. To unlock the shackles and take to the sky, leave everything that once held you down behind. This isn't about anyone else. It's about the conversation between you and the horizon that awaits. If you're lucky enough to be different, don't let go. I spend a lot of my time and energy exploring the power of perspective, how our reality is determined by how we interpret what's in front of us, how one person can look at one thing and see pain or a problem or a barrier, and another person can look at that exact same thing and see opportunity or a future win, or a bridge to something better. And I think one of the best examples of this is how we perceive those qualities that make us unique. Those things that put us in a different category. Maybe we're a little hesitant to fully embrace because they're not common. And when it comes to that which separates us from everyone else, well, I believe we have a decision to make. I'm gonna go back to Robert Frost's fork in the road, right? He says, two paths diverged in a wood. I took the one least traveled by and that made all the difference. On the surface, you could easily brush this off as trivial. It's like, oh, nice, that's cute. He took the path less traveled by. But what does that mean? As it turns out, it means a lot. It means instead of burying what makes him different, he made it his battle cry. Instead of slipping under the radar and sneaking through life like so many of us do, he signed the dotted line for the pain of being a beginner, the struggle of being uncertain the discipline and sometimes torturous road that is turning a passion into excellence, trading peace of mind for the pursuit of meaning in life. Exploring what makes you unique, it takes courage. And in that message, he chooses courage. Because it's not just that you're alone. Taking that path means every step of the way 
your mind screams at you reminders that you're alone. It's not just fighting traffic patterns, it's fighting your DNA. It's resisting that impulse to please sit down, shut up, and blend in. So is it a trivial decision? I'd say not really. Maybe even the most important decision you can make. Because I promise you it's not your commonality with those around you that will bring fulfillment that will leave a mark on your life and the world that surrounds you. No, it's that thing that's unequivocally you. That's a little out there, that's somewhat strange, that you don't know why, but it's gravitational force pulls and pulls and pulls. A tug of war, where one side begs you to just relax, conform, do less begs you to never be laughed at or criticized, to take the easy road. Then you have the other side, poking, prodding, asking you, hey, yeah, but what if? What if you sacrificed the comfort of right now? What if you explored? What if you took that which you love and you ran with it? What if you worked for a delayed payday? What if for a moment in time, when people ask you what the plan is, you have to look back and say, you know what? I'm not quite sure what I'm building but I'll keep pivoting until it's so clear you can see it from the moon. Those are the paths that pull us apart. And every time I've lost my way, it's because I've doubted my unique path. And I mean that every time. It's when I become impatient with the journey or look around and see someone else winning in a different arena using different methods, different strategies see the latest trends and success formulas. Hey man, I want part of that, right? I'm human, I want to win, I want to succeed. But just like a little opening is enough to let in the outside water that sinks the boat, well, a little bit of doubt is enough to derail your process. The process that you have to believe in, protect, nurture. A process that I've come to separate into two pieces. Number one, believing that the exploration of that thing that makes you unique, it's valuable. That your abilities mean something. They're not inconsequential. They're not stupid or trivial or unnecessary. If it means something to you, it will most certainly mean something to others. And you bringing it to life not only helps yourself evolve, grow, flourish, it helps the world. You just have to believe that enough to bring it to life. That's number one. Number two, trusting that as long as you don't stop in pursuit of your unique self, you can't lose. You can't lose. And I don't mean continuing to ram a square peg into a round hole. I mean growing, learning, experimenting, seeing what works. There's a saying that when you hit a dead end, it's not that the goal or the dream should be abandoned. It means the plan needs to be changed or adjusted. And as you get better and more experience and continually work to adjust your strategy and your plans, learn from your mistakes, It becomes a matter of time. You increase the odds with every step forward. Being different is the most precious thing afforded to you. But to realize that miracle requires a combination of both the mythical and the practical, the imaginary and the real. Dream that dream, visualize that growth, Create a world out of those ideas that don't exist yet. But also understand that the conversion process from dream to reality is a practical one. It requires repetition. Learning, losing, adjusting, and people don't like that. It's much easier to blend in than spend years pushing through the agony of setting yourself apart but it's worth it. 
and the evidence is so obvious, so plainly pointing to the fact that we only celebrate the outcasts, the crazy ones. We sit around campfires, listen to lectures, watch movies and documentaries about the people that had every reason to doubt themselves, but kept moving forward. About the people who could have swept their unique abilities under the rug, but instead used them as their foundation for everything. Not being distracted by what's popular or how anyone else lives or operates. Not seeking to be anyone but themselves, knowing that that is enough. Knowing it's the seed to something precious. The only question is, will you provide the right conditions and nourishment for that little seed to grow? Will you do what so few people have the courage to do? Let their authentic selves shine through. Let who they are emerge. Emerson has a quote. He says, to be yourself in a world that's constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. He goes on to say, my life should be unique. It should be an alms, a battle, a conquest, a medicine. And see, perpetual happiness is a fool's errand. No, life is full of trials and tribulations and ups and downs. But fulfillment comes from that quest for meaning, for more, for building something, for creating your unique self, a process, a pursuit that must be chiseled from stone. It's never given or provided. It has to be found, taken. And as Emerson beautifully implies, now is the time. The question is, what are you going to make with this once and a lifetime opportunity. What will you make of the possibilities that only you know, only you understand, that only you can bring to life? Never doubt yourself or your gifts or the things that set you apart. You don't need everyone else to believe in them. You just need to convince yourself. Everything else it falls right into place. Everyone wants to change the world, but no one wants to change himself. This was written by Leo Tolstoy uh, in reference to people's proclivity to point out at the world and project blame rather than to point in at themselves and ask, why? What can I do? Right? How can I be better? Which, when you think about it, is basically a shark forfeiting its bite, right? Or a bird giving up its wings. Our personal agency is without a doubt our superpower. Yet, from my vantage point, sometimes feels like we're walking away from that superpower a tiny step at a time. Little by little, day by day, we're allowing greatness to fade while bringing about the death of the hero. And well, that's a, a pretty big claim. What could I possibly mean by this? It's funny, when people ask me what I'm most proud of, you know, my mind pretty quickly uh, goes to my work, the brand that I've dedicated the last almost decade to building. But I don't think that's right. I think it's a product of my answer, but it's not my answer. What I'm most proud of is chipping away at the monster that is the victim mentality. You know, my default when things went wrong for so long was to feel bad for myself. It was easier to be the victim and sulk than it was to keep taking the hits. It's like a cheat code. When you can just bask in your sorrow and hate the world, you don't have to do anything. It's like a giant ibuprofen uh, for, for the discomfort that is life. 
But it relieves the symptom, not the cause. And to understand, to overcome this worldview is like being gifted with a new pair of eyes. And what I learned was that self-pity, it gets you nothing. It leaves you resentful, disappointed, envious, wandering down a path that is not your own. What I learned was that my story needed a hero. That's why as I grew, I spoke about the power and the beauty of doing the difficult thing. Running in the rain, chasing the metaphorical fireflies, taking the last train home. See, until you immerse yourself into that vast unknown, you stay in a cell of your own making. You build walls of limitation and you exist entirely within them. And as time has progressed, I look back, there are two things worth mentioning. One is that we find life's meaning in the difficult thing. And two, there is a fundamental misunderstanding and even from time to time contempt for what the difficult thing means, for those who speak of the difficult thing as though hard truths are in some way inconsiderate. Like diverging from the comfort of one's feelings implies a lack of empathy. But that's wrong. If you love someone, if you care about someone, if you care about yourself, you say what is true. And what is true is that the shelter and the temporary comfort of victimhood is a high not worth the withdrawal, not worth the suffering. It got me nowhere, it will get you nowhere, and that is a reality that will never cease to be true. We live in a world that's been shaped entirely by those who found the courage to do the difficult thing. Everything around us is a product of the courageous decision to take the now and bend it. And that means taking hits. It means being criticized. It means by definition, you are choosing to be uncommon. You're choosing to change things. Yourself. And by default, the world around you. There's nothing wrong with being common. Quitting is relatable. Failure is relatable. Falling short is relatable. Because we're all human and we've all been there. But these stock features of humanity, they are not worth celebrating. We don't put on pedestals the familiar. No, we put on pedestals the times that we've reshaped the familiar. And a world of participation trophies is a world that has disincentivized that which makes life worth living. It cripples the very pursuit that ignites the soul, a push towards the extraordinary. It's time we resurrect the hero. See through the facade of short-term comfort that leads to long-term emptiness. In a world where attention is currency, it's time we acknowledge the payment we receive when we play victim buys only despair. Sure, we're flawed. That will always be true, but we are capable of manufacturing greatness. We're capable of capturing hearts and captivating minds. If you could only see within yourself that story unwritten, if you could feel the greatness that awaits, the roads to be traveled and mountains to be climbed, there would be no debate. There'd be no hesitation about that march to the belly of the beast. If only to show that our demons exist solely where we allow them to. Resurrect the hero. Fight those battles that light you up. Blaze your trail through the valley of darkness. Take that path unknown to the common man, unseen to those who live within the confines of what is. Resurrect that hero because you need you because the world needs you
There's no time to be down or sad or dwell on the mistakes of yesterday. There's too much on the line to pretend that settling was the plan all along or to point at the obstacles with disdain and hatred while life rotates around you. No, resurrect the hero. Resurrect your answer. Resurrect the person you were meant to be. It may not be simple or intuitive. It may cause you to give more than you knew you had. It may not be easy. But my friend, easy never changed the world. That thing that gives you butterflies, that lights you up, that world you see when you close your eyes, chase that with all of your soul, chase it. It's easy to brush off life's potential. It's just outside the realm of possibility. To see the ideal as some form of window shopping that you can almost touch. A fantasy to be explored when you sit back in your office chair or pass time in the doctor's office waiting room. But I think these aspirations mean more than that. Not distractions, but a North Star. Not a diversion, but the path. And by the way, I'm not naive about this pursuit and all that it entails, the truth behind it. I'd never advocate that what's possible or meant to be is somehow easy. In fact, I'd argue the only way something is meant to be is if you're willing to commit to the difficulty in bringing it to life. Otherwise, it wasn't meant to be anything but a missed opportunity. Because it surely will be a difficult road. And here's what we come to learn. Everything of value is difficult. You know, and in an attempt to oversimplify, I often break life down into the easy thing versus the difficult but meaningful thing. And in some ways, sure, that's true. But I can also honestly say it would have been more difficult for me to have stayed where I was, not moved at all, to not have pursued what I believed in. It would have been more difficult thinking about that life I could have lived, the doors that could have opened, and that's just it. Life is about choosing your difficult. The difficult you seek out intentionally, or the difficult you come and let take control, render you helpless. And I think when we find ourselves in routines or we've built for ourselves a world you know, we know we don't want to live in anymore or we've outgrown, it's not that the current is real and the future is not. It's that we, somewhere along the way, decided to face the wrong opponent. Some adversaries make us stronger. They force us to be more, to grow. Other adversaries or opponents, they sit back and they let us defeat ourselves. And that's what we don't want. See, when the world knocks you down, 
you get to rise again. Wiser, tougher, stronger. But when you keep yourself down, well, there's nothing to be gained from that. Those two opponents, they are not the same. I reference my speaking career because for me, it's where that transformation is most evident. It's where it all began. My opponent was very much me, avoiding opportunities, hiding from failure. I didn't give life a chance to knock me down. And so it didn't. How could it? I'd already placed myself in chains. And because of that, guess what? I stayed the same. I couldn't evolve. My ideal future was an idea that would briefly entertain me from time to time and move right on. It wasn't until I found the courage to switch my opponents from myself to the world, I let life humble me. I gave talks where I was nervous and had cold feet, keynotes where my delivery was mediocre at best, where I barely got by. But with these battles came metaphorical riches, came that trust that had to be manufactured, that confidence that had to be earned. When I got out of my own way, I was able to let the trials and tribulations of life create a new foundation for me to stand on, to redefine reality. And the good news is that anyone can do that. Anyone can ask that question. Is something external in my way right now that I need to figure out, that I need to solve? Or am I in my own way? Am I not even giving myself a shot? Have I settled for right now as truth? When right now is just the less ideal, difficult. When I was little, playing action figures with my buddy up the street, we used to think it was cool to see around corners, to see through walls, to know what was coming before it arrived, right? For action figures, absolutely. In superhero movies, why not? But in the journey through life, you don't need to see around corners. In fact, it's counterproductive because it is the interaction with the unknown that matters. It's adjusting amidst life's uncertainty that comes to make you who you are, transforms you and your reality. As far as I'm concerned, the only way to lose is to remain behind that corner peering out every now and then, hoping to get some kind of advantage or shortcut. Willing to let life pass you by while you wait for the stars to align, thinking that that vision of an ideal life will stroll along the sidewalk, see you and reach out a hand. That wait will be a long one, unproductive and difficult, more difficult than trusting yourself to face whatever lurks around that corner. So remember that who you are is built. And every time you do something a little bit scary or unsettling, every time you wander a step or two outside of your comfort zone, the reward is not just the short-term triumph you feel as you leapfrog that obstacle and carry on. No, you are investing in a new you a new reality. You're investing in something changing before your very eyes, putting a little marble in a jar that is your potential and you can't see it, not now. No one's going to announce it to you. You might not even realize or understand until you look back years down the road. But those little acts of courage, they matter more than you know. They're not trivial and they are certainly not insignificant. When that movie plays in your head and you think to yourself, I wish or if only, and the delta between that image and 
the reality on the ground disappoints you, gives you a little knot in your stomach or dissatisfaction that floats around in your thoughts. Remember that that feeling is transferable. That difficult can be exchanged for one that actually changes things. You can get off the merry-go-round and towards a new North Star. Difficult, yes, but we've seen the goal is not to avoid difficult. It's to pick the difficult that will transform your life. It's to find meaning in a world that if you do not pay attention, will paint your landscape with routine and obligation. And today can certainly be a continuation of that script. A box that's checked, a calendar square with an X. Or it can be the beginning of something that gives you butterflies, that lights you up, that brings you one step closer to the world you see when you close your eyes. There's a quote from George Eliot that states it's never too late to be what you might have been. And see, that ability to separate the stories of yesterday from the stories of right now will always be what determine your tomorrow. I'm still searching for the best way to really articulate this message, to emphasize just how precious this moment right now could be. If only we decided to make it so. If only we recognized the power in choosing to begin again. Now, I understand the power of habits, how they define us, and how, practically speaking, change isn't as easy as saying you're going to be something and then just becoming that thing. No, you have to build habits, your actions. They become your life. And there are plenty of resources on habit building. And James Clear being one of my favorites and someone I point to often. One of his best quotes, he says, the task of building a good habit is like cultivating a delicate flower one day at a time, right? Meaning little actions over time create big results. But before any of that, before any steps, before any habits, before any action, we have to know that once a page is turned, it's gone. It becomes data to guide your next decision, and that's all. It's understanding that yesterday is not you. Only a resource for you to look back on as you reflect on what worked and what didn't, what you loved and what you didn't love, where you went and why it mattered. But you're not yesterday's losses or mistakes or tragedies. Just like today's weather is ultimately independent from yesterday's. Sure, they may follow the same patterns, same rules, same guidelines, and that's great. That's how we get the data that allows us to look back and calculate what's best for us. But ultimately, today is a new day. A day with the potential, the capability of becoming something extraordinarily beautiful. And we may think, okay, right, I get it. Sure, I can become something new. All right, let's go. The question is, do you really believe it? Do you really understand how malleable you are, how you can bend and fold and shape yourself into something new? Because the second you get that quick blast of motivation, right, that tiny bit of courage and dip your toe in the water, what happens? Life says, 
not so fast. Your mind presses play on a giant projector showing the film of who you used to be, right? not who you want to be. Social media displays a seemingly perfect collage of everyone around you pretending to live problem-free lives and prompting you to think, oh, this must mean I'm doing something wrong. Like TV, news, media, politicians tell you that life is too hard. You're too oppressed to find your way out of this. Of course, not without their help. So why try, one might think. Friends may disappear or worse, criticize the fact that you've changed as if that wasn't the point of life in its entirety. And my message is this. Yes, change comes from habits. And yes, habits are small daily decisions, but also creating that mental space to welcome in those new habits. To understand you're worthy of more, to understand right now is a beginning. That is both the greatest challenge and greatest accomplishment. Giving yourself permission amidst an endless array of adversaries, that's what makes or breaks you. Not how close you keep your running shoes to the door so that you see them and it triggers those AM workout sessions. No, that stuff's important, but does it matter if you don't see yourself as someone who's gonna use those shoes as a tool to change into something new? To put them on when you don't want to? When you feel tired? When you're busy? Who are you going to choose to be? And can you hold on to that idea? See, I obviously enjoy motivation, right? I consume a video or, or an audio almost every morning. I feel like it gets me in the right headspace and then I get on with my work, right? And for the most part, it does a great job of communicating to us what we need for that moment. It's like, believe in yourself. Work hard. Don't you dare give up. Amen. But where it sometimes drops the ball, in my opinion, is the why. Why believe in myself? Why work hard? Why not give up? And the answer is because we are these incredibly gifted beings with the ability to change and adapt and grow, but are confronted with a world that wants to tell you no. Change is immediately met with resistance, as if it prefers life at rest. It begs for stagnation. And you, even thinking that you can rearrange the order of things, shakes life at its foundation. And when we feel that, there's a default uncertainty, a mini panic. How can something be right when it just feels like every move forward is a right hook to the face? Like we're constantly pushing into the headwind. I'll never forget, it was almost two years into my journey as a speechwriter, a YouTuber, a, a content creator, right? Two years since I left my job. And I felt guilty taking an afternoon jog. It felt like a luxury I wasn't entitled to. Something that minimal. It took time for me to stop thinking about that and enjoy it. That's how crazy it was. Something so tiny and insignificant. Now imagine the weight of the big things. With change, the hard thing is the right thing. That's a, that's a tough idea to, to, to put our hands around to hold, to embrace. What we least want to do is so often what we need. But as Campbell says, the cave we fear holds the treasure we seek. As Peterson says, the dragon protects the gold. Jim Rohn, the winters of life give way to the springs and the summers. Nietzsche said there's no beautiful surface without a terrible depth. To become who we might be hurts. 
And I'm not sure why it has to be this way. Perhaps a test to weed out those who don't really want it. Or maybe it's what we learn when we leave the pieces of ourselves we no longer want behind. Or maybe it's because without that fight, without that suffering, evolution just wouldn't mean as much. But the climb, it creates the view. Regardless the reason, I hope the point comes through and it comes through loud and clear and not just now as your alarm clock goes off and you're looking for that extra push to get up, but tomorrow, in the morning after that, when things become a little bit harder and the finish line feels a little less real, a little less visible, the person you hope to become is as real as the present moment. It's as real when you're excited and motivated as it is when you're discouraged and down. But look around you and understand that it's counterintuitive. As crazy, as frustrating as it might be, the discomfort and uncertainty does not mean you are lost or you've wandered too far. It means you're right where you need to be. It's the little price to be paid every day for monumental change. So as you look out your front door, know that more does exist. Know that it will demand more of you than you've ever given and know that you are capable of not only meeting but exceeding those demands and that it will be the most rewarding, incredible, meaningful journey of your life. Dream away, because dreams remind us of hope. Hope that becomes courage. Courage that manifests itself in little steps forward. Steps that over time create a new world. A new world that looks a lot different than the one you once knew. So dream away. Dream away because we have all been blessed with the ability to take nothings and make them somethings. We've all been given the power to take blank spaces and make them landscapes to see with our eyes worlds that aren't yet there. And what a shame it would be to repress that gift, to label it fiction to keep it next to our books and our movies, how much a tragedy to allow it to be merely a temporary escape instead of the permanent beginning it was meant to be. So dream away. Let it lead you because dreams, they'll either become the stories we tell or the regrets we hide away, a personal evolution or untapped potential. The reason we jump out of bed in the morning or the reason we keep our eyes closed, clinging to the last few seconds of joy before we confine ourselves to the self-made prisons we built, the invisible walls that separate what we see from the possibility a short trip away. But look around you, one might say. This is reality. And this looks a lot different than the dreams that bounce around in my head. If dreaming was some magic formula, I'd be there already. Well, magic isn't quite my claim. No, dreams are not magic. I think their composition is so simple, so practical, so obtainable that magic it isn't needed here. In fact, thinking dreams require some larger-than-life magic might just be the problem. Dreams require a willingness to start and a single step forward. The rest 
Well, the rest we figure out along the way. Every little decision to carry on through the haze of that great unknown, that's where we discover life's possibility. And if that's magic, then my friend, we are all magicians. Okay, he might inquire further, but is any of it guaranteed? Hmm. Well, that's a highly complex question as we make our way through this highly complex world. But I will do this. I'll guarantee one thing and one thing only. If you do not dream of better tomorrows, today will be eternal. Things will stay exactly as they are now. See, your dream is the North Star that guides the path. The target calling the arrows, it's the lighthouse that brings the ship home from sea. And without a foundation to build upon, you'll have nothing to stand on. So instead of talking about guarantees, let's talk about lost opportunity cost. Let's talk about what happens if you don't go, if you don't explore, if you don't build, what will you miss? See, most people, they only understand what has already been created. Let's not be most people. Why stay in the lines when there's nothing else to discover? Why black and white when color changes the dynamic entirely? The greatest enemy of possibility, of potential, is one's need for certainty. It's the person who talks about something more, but knows something more will remain an afterthought. Because as beautiful as it sounds, it's not guaranteed. And because they cannot guarantee something better, they will guarantee the status quo. But I'm asking you to see the flaws in that line of thinking. I'm asking you to understand that our very biology cries out for safety. That we have to fight our urge to settle. Our desire to take the monster we know over the one we don't because it's the monsters we don't know that put meaning into life. It's the journey that elevates the destination. And while it might feel like what you want in the short term, that long term, it sings a different tune. To get where you need to go, you have to move into the headwind that is the comfort of now. Find within yourself the courage to simply crack the door, to just let a little bit of light in and see how it forces its way into every corner of your soul. Once you feel that satisfaction of progress. You'll be consumed, pulled in, as though the only thing larger than fear of failure is the rush of becoming who you were meant to be. I once heard something that changed the way I looked at the world, something simple, the idea that we don't climb the mountain for the view. We climb mountains because of who we become on the journey up. The view is merely representative of that journey. The dream isn't in and of itself the goal. It's an invitation to immerse yourself in all that is beautiful, meaningful, worthwhile, jaw-dropping, eye-opening, and powerful. It is what cracks that door and lets the light in. So dream away. Because that dream, it's no threat to your safety. It's what will ultimately save you. So dream away. Dream away so that you capture that sunrise you were given. Dream away so that you are pulled to that which makes life worth living. Dream away so that you never lose that child inside so that you don't leave the adventure on the table and keep your ideal existence on the shelf. Dream away so that you see the abundance that surrounds us. 
the hope within us and the future that calls us for yourself. The people in your life and the ones who eventually will be dream away. What if I told you that you already know what must be done? You just need to put yourself in position to do it. You need to unlearn the rules that crippled you, the ideas that confined you. We are in constant pursuit of the thing that will magically right all our wrongs, the answer that will give us something we've never had. No, everything you need, you have now. You just need to allow it to flourish. Declutter, simplify, remove all that unnecessary stuff and walk your path. Einstein once said, everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And what's great about this is the idea that who we are is not found. It's acknowledged, it's accepted. And I think in our world, there are so many fish, as Einstein says, trying to climb trees that it creates a sense of learned helplessness. We are judging ourselves using the wrong metrics, equipped with the skills, the characteristics, and and the abilities to win in our own arenas, but playing in someone else's. How loyal are you to your own instincts? Do you do what you know is right? Or what you feel obligated to pursue? When was the last time you listened to you? In Tim Grover's Relentless, he introduces a brilliant metaphor. He says, a lion doesn't have to be taught to be a lion. It just is. It hunts, runs, roams, explores, lives life the only way it knows how. Now, if you capture a lion, bring it to the zoo or put it in a cage, it will carry itself differently. It will lie down, move around lazily, sluggishly navigate its little space, To passers-by, they'd never know what that lion really is. They'd never know what it looks like in its element. But despite all this, it is still, in fact, a lion. It maintains that killer instinct. His characteristics haven't disappeared. And if it were released from the cage, It would go right back to doing what lions do, being what lions are meant to be. It just has to ditch the cage. And the point is, perhaps, so do you. There's a little light in your soul that waits day and night to explode into something meaningful, where your nature meets your environment, where the I shouldn't do this, the odds are impossible, the I'm not good enough, I can't lose what I have now, where all that fades away, where it's left behind you, and you're finally free to reign over your own territory, your own life, your own empire. See, we constantly feel like our glasses are empty, like we're missing pieces, in need of something, just one more thing. That will be our answer. That's all we need. 
And I can say with confidence, it's not about what you need. It's about what you no longer need. It's about mitigating the noise so what matters can shine through. Removing those people in your life that drag you down or add no value. It's about getting rid of the things that make your world unnecessarily complex. Removing the need for immediate validation, success, and accolades. And instead embracing the little hinges in your life that, as W. Clement Stone said, will ultimately swing the biggest doors. We all have the lock, the key, and the map right there amidst the trivialities of our day to day. And we walk right by them, look right at them. We pick them up and put them down. But have we learned to truly see them? Everything starts with that awareness. My life did not change until I recognized that. Until I began asking myself questions I'd never asked before, big picture questions obvious questions but just because it's obvious doesn't mean it's always intuitive right what do i want out of life what is important to me what's something i love doing that i can dedicate myself to that i can commit to being great at long term that i'm so immersed in that when the inevitable down times arrive the losses when the doubt and insecurity creeps in I can keep moving forward because I'm so in love with the process that I don't let the little things like that define me. As Jordan Peterson famously puts it, choose your sacrifice. A life of meaning isn't easy, but there's nothing more fulfilling. Because when you embark upon that journey, it allows for the evolution of the self. We can become something more. As Nietzsche says, those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. We equip ourselves for anything the universe can throw at us. We position ourselves to evolve. Viktor Frankl says, man's main concern is not to gain pleasure or to avoid pain, but rather to see meaning in his life. To align yourself with and pursue that which is your reason for living, that's how we transcend the day-to-day -day life we've come to know. When we breathe in possibility, dance with the infinite, and of course, something of this magnitude, it consists of ups and downs. It's not the easy road, but it's the one worth taking. Our metaphorical lion doesn't succeed every time he's prowling for food. But he doesn't roll over and die. He doesn't recede or quit being a lion. He gets up tomorrow and does it again. Because it's who the lion is. And while life doesn't unfold until you find that same thing for yourself. And people say, well, I don't know. That's the problem. I have no idea. That's not the problem. That's the essence of life. That's the beauty. You're here to explore and find that for yourself. But the power is knowing you're not looking for something or someone to save you. You're looking for an environment in which you can best be you. You're looking for the right terrain to share your gift with the world. If you have what you need, then you're not looking for the product you're looking for the delivery mechanism, the vehicle to nurture and transport your value to a world that desperately needs it. You're looking to build yourself up and in the process, amaze yourself. Look, what you're capable of is beyond comprehension. It's limitless, almost unfathomable. But it is, as Ryan Holiday says, a confidence that must be earned, so start now earn it. Let yourself succeed. Your intuition knows what feels right and what doesn't. But the seed must first be planted. 
So make today about setting yourself up for success, turning off the idea that you're one piece away from completion, one minute away from starting, that you're almost ready. No, you are ready now. You have what you need now. You know what's necessary now. You just have to be your own ally. Put yourself in position to be yourself. Let your value shine. Double down on what matters to you. Look, it's not a game of acquisition. It's a game of courage. Do you have the courage to be who you are? To follow that potential, that possibility into the great unknown. This moment is a collage of your past. The steps that brought you here, of the things that shaped you. It's a story comprised of what you choose to remember. And so I ask, which memories get your attention? Where do you choose to shine that potentially life-changing spotlight? What are you looking back on? Do you remember those times you felt lost? Those times life was turned upside down when you went into panic mode, when your perfectly mapped out reality was shaken at its foundation. Yet you got up and found steady ground, didn't you? Do you remember that? Do you remember when the things you thought were forever turned out to be as fleeting as a setting sun? When you realized a life well lived would mean figuring out the vast majority of it on your own, relying on your courage and your strength. Yet you pushed into the dark of night and lit a path, didn't you? Do you remember that? Do you remember the hard hits? The blatant losses, the gut-punching defeats when you looked in the mirror and thought, this reflection, it's just not who it needs to be. This burden is too much to carry. Yet you got yourself together, you found faith in your reflection. And you not only carried that burden, but you made something of it, didn't you? Do you remember that? What do you choose to remember? And I'm not talking imagine or create or bring to life. No, which truths are you letting in? How quickly we forget who we are. How fleeting the recollection of our strength. See, if you take a single step back and examine, you'll see a breathtaking sample size of the demons already defeated. The mountains already climbed, the dragons already slayed, and you stand here now, afraid and unsure, as if you haven't already fought through the depths of hell, as if you haven't already proven to yourself that you've been there, as if this moment is new to you. You have what you need. And that's not the law of attraction or conjecture or hopeful thinking. It's remembering what you know in your soul to be true. You are made for this road laid out before you. When the water rises, it's sink or swim. We pick up certain truths as we make our way through life. Realizations, little awakenings, patterns that allow us to map the things around us so that we can navigate this crazy place. And here's one such realization for my own journey. 
When you pursue your best, you live your best life. Your best is a North Star to guide you a bar, line, or benchmark that's always moving, a reminder that you can always do more and be more. A reminder that life tomorrow can always be different than life today. To pursue your best, in my opinion, is synonymous with capturing all that is good in this world. Capitalizing on potential is to utilize those resources in need of an architect. That pen in need of a poet, brush in need of a painter, story in need of a writer or populace in need of a leader. It's a pursuit that not only supplements our existence here on earth. No, I believe it is in and of itself why we are here on earth. But like every ideal, pragmatism seems to get in the way. Meaning, well, life is more difficult in execution than it looks on paper. We can't be our quote unquote best every day. We sometimes fall short of that mark. Our outcomes don't always align with our expectations. The perpetual journey to one's best is neither straight nor without discomfort. It's more like the navigating of a new world without a map or compass. A world that we're by default ill-equipped to take on when we begin. And I believe that 99% of success is reliant upon the willingness to move into that great unknown and allowing adversity to shape us. But that remaining 1% is a little bit different. That 1% is when we see what we've never seen, do what we've never done. It's uncovering our best in those moments we feel our worst, climbing the highest when we're at our lowest. When the water rises, it's finding a way to swim. See, the majority of life calls for tiny adjustments. It's observing and learning and moving on. But rarely do we talk about the darkest moments when we feel as though we are up to our neck in the trials and tribulations of life. When the world doesn't relay messages of hope or prosperity. No, the only incoming message is despair. You're essentially David looking up at Goliath. Perhaps a Goliath of your making. Perhaps not, but a Goliath nonetheless. So why here? Why are these dark moments different than the 99%? Why is a stage provided at the very time when the limelight feels further out of reach than it ever has? Because this, this moment is when you prove to yourself who you are. You think you've dug deep in the past? You think you've given your all back then? No, you have no idea what you're capable of. The world provides a stage in our darkest moments so that you can pull back the curtains and illuminate your strength. It floods your world with adversity so that you can trust yourself to navigate the waters. And if you can find a way here, when the walls are closing, clock is ticking and water is rising, what can't you do? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Those moments show us what we can be, and that is why the 1% is everything. Why is it that rock bottom becomes a bridge to so many new tomorrows? Or the losses we dread most become the change we need most? The answer is simple. Because in those moments, we find within ourselves the keys to transformation. See, you didn't know that you can leap that far. And you didn't know 
because you've never been pushed so close to the edge, running at so fast a speed. But in those moments, you learn that you can take flight. You learn you have the power to stand again. So while the vast majority of life is saying yes when most would say no, it's how we choose to act while immersed in our lowest lows that provides the framework and the opportunity. I believe that the tears indicative of despair streaming down your face look a lot like the tears that emerge during our happiest moments. They are the same. One just precedes the other. See, despair gives you a chance to look at life differently, look at yourself differently, to look in the mirror and understand that the reflection looking back is capable of leading a revolution in your soul. And I get how hard that is, how detached from reality it might seem, but isn't that what tomorrow is? A detachment from the reality, the parameters and the rules of today? It's not until that seed is buried beneath the earth that it plants roots, that it takes aim at the sky, and when you are stuck beneath the chaos of life, you have to know that this is where you too transform. So forget yesterday's shoreline, this is where you build tomorrow's destination. Don't fixate on what is gone when you can dream of all that is to come. And don't dwell on who you were when you can celebrate all you will be. When the water rises, swim. One of life's greatest lessons is that yesterday is only as powerful as we allow it to be. Yesterday is an idea, a story, a movie that started and ended. Now, it's quite possible that story or that ending is disappointing or it hurts to look back on. Perhaps a reminder of something that wasn't ideal, something you want to break away from. So the question is, why do we give that old story power? Why do we relive it, create this self-inflicted wound? See, the past undoubtedly played a critical role. It brought you to where you are now. It, in many ways, shaped your worldview, constitutes your beliefs. It was the very road to this moment, and there's value in that. But imagine this scenario. Imagine stepping into your car, turning the keys, and thinking to yourself that you can, in this very moment, only drive down the roads you drove on yesterday. Only associate with the street signs you know, the places you've already gone. Your reality now is determined by what you've already done. So adjust and get used to it. You would say that's outrageous, right? Yesterday's path has nothing to do with where I'm going now. Just like a boat's wake trailing off behind it has nothing to do with where it's going next. The person holding the wheel controls that. We are saturated with freedom. There is so much opportunity and possibility and potential in front of us that we fail to see because we can't stop thinking about that fictitious story we call yesterday. We confuse the path we took then for the one we need now, the wake from the steering wheel, what is, and that story about what was. The gateway to change is unshackling ourselves from those imaginary monsters. 
And more often than not, the answer isn't in finding some solution, it's in cutting ties with those things that no longer serve us. Then we see the world as it truly is. Then we see the magic laid out before us. And I get that it's easier said than done. Leaving a part of us behind hurts. Looking in the mirror and being vulnerable enough to say, I can be more than this. It's not easy, but it's possible. And everything starts with how we see ourselves. And when we remain captives to the past, everything about who we think ourselves to be is outdated. We're neglecting one of our superpowers, the perpetual ability to restart. And one of the most important conversations I've ever had was on this topic. It seemed trivial at the time, but I was having lunch with a friend and we're talking and I mentioned to her that I was full. And she goes, well, then why are you still eating? And I'm like, because I paid for it, right? I wanted to get my money's worth. And she says in a very you know, pragmatic way, Eddie, just because you paid for it doesn't mean you need to eat it, right? It's a sunk cost. Why don't you move on? And the whole thing seems silly, right? It's like, yeah, if you're not hungry, don't eat move on. But in the grand scheme of things, how many of us keep on consuming that which doesn't serve us? How many of us stay too long when we should be letting go? We let the path behind us dictate the one before us. See, there's a tendency to overvalue what we know, to feel so invested in how things are even when we're not happy or it's not healthy, that we'll take the pain of now over the potential for something greater. And that's precisely why the unknown is so terrifying. It's not concrete. It's a world unsettled. And man, do we hate being unsettled. But what we fail to realize is that every time we close our eyes, take a breath and work up the courage to step into that unknown, to leave yesterday behind us, life gives us new pieces. It resets the stage. It provides new tools to build something incredible, something more ideal, more conducive to our goals, our hopes and our dreams. And the thought is, well, but, but what if things become worse than they are right now? What if I move forward and I find myself more confused, more lost? What if things are, are more chaotic? And that may, for a moment, be true. But what we do is we adjust. We learn things we never knew. We see things through a lens that we never could. Touch things that we never thought existed. It wasn't in staying, but in leaving, that we rediscovered who we were meant to be. That we allowed our truest selves to flourish and worst case scenario, contrary to popular belief, it's not that the world ends. No, the worst case scenario, should you find the courage to move forward, is that you end up right back where you started, a little more confident, a little bolder, and better prepared to live this life like you never had. All that's needed is for you to convince yourself that there is more. You just need to taste the fruit, step into the sunlight. That's the difference between reality and the story in your head. Reality is that this world has for you everything you need to change, to grow, explore, build a life that means something. It has the support structures and the resources for you to pull yourself back up every time you fall. To say, okay, that hurt, but now let's try a different angle. There is undoubtedly what you need. And the question is never whether the X on that treasure map exists. Trust me, it's there. The question is whether you can pause that story in your head. The tales of a dark, mean, and scary world trying to hold you down. Pause the idea that you're nothing more than the you of yesterday. 
you're nothing more than how people knew you to be. Pause the idea that you're nothing without that job title or that relationship. Pause the idea that you need him or her or them in your life. Every day you wake up, you are a blank canvas. Who cares about yesterday? What do you want to paint now? When you walk out your front door, where do you want to go now? Step outside that circle of familiarity. See how artificial and in some cases ridiculous these boundaries are that we place around ourselves. Life is an invitation, not a set of requirements. And when you free yourself of that, not only will you feel like someone new, not only will you experience life as it was meant to be experienced, but you'll see that this world will conform to your new definition. This world wants to support you. It wants to lift you up. And yeah, it may be challenging and strenuous. It may force you to work harder and be braver than you've ever been. But it is at the end of the day, your ally. You just have to see your future self before it materializes, when no one else gets it. So move on from all that does not serve you. Break away from the old rules, regulations, and guidelines. Maybe you exhausted time and energy into creating this reality. Maybe it feels like a monumental piece of your identity. Maybe right now is the only security you have. Fine. But my hope is that you can respect it and walk away. See it as the sunken cost that it is. Just because you paid to get there doesn't mean you need to keep paying to make wrong decisions. Just because it took your time doesn't mean it's entitled to keep stealing your time. Just because it's part of your identity now doesn't mean it must be tomorrow. Just because it creates security doesn't mean it's right. Jails and steel bars are also incredibly secure. No, today, we are breaking free, leaving the past in the past and setting our sights on the horizon. Today is the end of yesterday and the beginning of the rest of your life. There's an idea coined by Aristotle that suggests knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. I want to talk a little bit about why I believe that to be true. I went on a trip to the West Coast a few weeks ago, and obviously there's a time difference there. When I came back, it was a little jet lagged threw me off my routine a little bit and, and for the first few days back in Florida I slept in which makes perfect sense right my body was still on west coast time but then three days went by and four and five and then a week and I kept setting the alarm and I kept sleeping through it and this drove me crazy right I love my mornings and you know I can go into that some other time but uh, the, the bottom line is I kept even knowing it's in my best interest to get up I stayed in bed okay so one week went by going to bed planning out my perfect day setting the alarm only to sleep in it had uh, evolved from you know a reasonable transition to a clear display of personal weakness you know, mapping out what was best and then failing to do it because, you know, I was comfortable under those covers. Q. Einstein's famous definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. See, my perfect day on paper continued to be obliterated by the very elementary and foundational challenges of reality. And if you think this is small, I just want to remind you that the little things ultimately become the big things, right? In other words, no one conducts themselves one way for the small and seemingly trivial aspects of life and then, you know, suddenly levels up and becomes highly disciplined, you know, an organized force of nature when it really matters. No, you are who you are. We're defined by our habits and it filters into all aspects of life. You know, that's why Admiral McRaven talks about, you know, making your bed. You don't do the small things right, you can't do the big things right. 
And to me, this was a red flag. I wanted to fix this, perhaps needed to fix this. And I spent some time thinking about it. And as I was running, listening to an audiobook, it hit me. I made what I think is one of the most important connections uh, I've made in a long time. And uh, to explain this idea, I'm going to briefly kind of take us up a level and explore one of the greatest checks on human nature in the history of mankind. And then I'll bring us right back down to the practical, the alarm clocks, workout routines, and daily planners. Sometimes the philosophical opens a door for the practical day-to-day problems we have in life, uh, which is why I love connecting those dots. They help me see things with, with clarity. And so this began with a quote from James Madison in Federalist 51. He says, if men were angels, there would be no need for government. And what he's doing there is he's making a case for a constitutional system or technology that attempts to stop the greatest threat to government ever to exist, which is human nature. He's advocating for a framework that will save us from ourselves. See, it's not that human beings aren't capable of incredible things, beautiful things, magnificent things, because they are. But it's because they are also prone to do terrible things. We're prone to act irrationally, to seek and hold on to power, to break off into factions and groups. And success of the whole over a long period of time requires more than anything else that we're able to, and this is the point, recognize and repress those inevitable negatives. Let's not be delusional and aim for the perfection of men because humans aren't perfect. Humans will never be perfect. And so to wrap this metaphor up, That's why the U.S. governmental system today is modeled all over the world, in places like Canada and India and Brazil. It's because it is brilliantly one of gridlock and conflicting interests. It's why the legislature is cut in two. It's why there's three branches of government all checking each other, a system of federalism, all because of the nature of man. See, sometimes what you prevent is just as or more important than what you create. Again, perfect? No. But the expectation of perfection, it destroys more than it builds. This idea of utopia or the perfection of human beings doesn't have a great track record throughout history. It dismisses human nature. So Eddie, what does this have to do with sleeping in in the morning? What does this have to do with making tomorrow's perfect plan before you go to bed every night and then seeing it fall to pieces when the pillow feels, you know, amazing at 6 a.m.? Well, I'm going to, to hijack Madison's idea here. It's similar in the sense that you haven't allowed the best of you to take hold and flourish because you haven't addressed the worst of you that keeps trying to make its way into the picture. If you're aware enough to understand yourself and the things you do that get in the way of your happiness, you are on your way. Because you stop trying to jam a square peg of perfection into the round hole of reality and you start operating practically. Looking to mitigate the things that you're doing that are constantly holding you down. Build checks and balances into your own life. I am no angel and neither are you. So let's put ourselves in the best position we can to succeed and overcome the realities of life. Right? I mean, this very idea is why books like Atomic Habits and The Power of Habit have sold millions of copies because they help us navigate around the mental traps, constantly seeking to pull us into old routines. Right? The best way to, to not eat junk food, according to Charles Duhigg, don't have any in your cabinet. The best way to watch less TV, according to James Clear, hide the remote in a different room when you're working. Best way to stick to that workout routine, put your running shoes by the door, right? Make it easier on yourself to say yes, to defeat the demons that hold us back. 
Again, if we were angels in our own lives, we'd see that remote, we'd smile, we'd ignore it. We'd look at the Instagram app and we'd say, nope, not now, Instagram, I have a business to build, but we are not angels. And winning requires building systems into our own lives that allow us to win. So how did I defeat that monster that, that, that kept me in bed in the morning? By making it so hard to say no that it was comical. By checking my temptation so that failing was actually more difficult than succeeding. I right? made my bedroom immaculate, went to bed early, laid out my clothes, put my alarm clock on the other side of the room uh, with a glass of water next to it, an old album I made in 2014 to remind me how far I've come and in the purpose of the journey I'm on. If I was going to fail the next day, it would be because I said no over and over again to everything that's important to me. If I failed that morning, it would mean my priorities need adjusting, not my sleep schedule. And so the next day, I did get up. And as W. Clement Stone said, it was a little hinge that swung a big door. See, I believe life is about momentum. Feeling good about yourself, giving yourself the best shot possible to evolve, to grow, to chase down the meaning in life. And absolutely, we want to be better. We want our eyes fixated on the stars and our compass pointing towards the horizon. But we have to first unshackle ourselves from the delusion that we play by a different set of rules than the ones that govern the universe. Winning means understanding yourself and life so that you can be someone who rigs the game in your favor. That's why I love Aristotle's quote. Understanding yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Until you've truly captured what you want and how you're preventing yourself from getting it, you simply can't operate at a high level. And so I'll end with the, the reiteration that you are no angel. And no, you never will be perfect. But recognizing and forging your trail around that fact, positioning the best of you to outdo the worst of you, will take you a lot further than staying where you are and waiting for wings. woke up this morning to the songbird singing her sweet melodies like only she knows how perched above the street looking down at the people the cars but somehow indifferent to all that below like her heart was fully immersed in her song as I got out of bed opened the curtains and let the early morning sun make its way into my room, I reveled in the moment. It was both simple and perfect, two things that often go hand in hand. And as I made my way to the kitchen for that cup of coffee, I had a thought. That little songbird out there, she'll never understand how beautiful she is. She'll never know that she made my morning just a little brighter or that she helped lift my spirits after a less than ideal yesterday. No, she's just doing her. And in return, making a mark on a world that needs what she has to give. So what? Well, maybe there's something we can learn from the songbird as we go about making our way in the world. As far as I'm concerned, there have been two great challenges in my life, finding my song, and then finding the courage to sing it. Or perhaps put another way, discovering who you are 
and then holding on tight in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else, as Emerson said, is the greatest accomplishment. It will always be a challenge to bring our thoughts to life because, well, people tend to only see what's placed right in front of them. It's just not realistic to place tomorrow at someone's feet, but here's the magic. I don't think that songbird cares about being realistic. See, over time, we've done quite the dance, reality and I. Like a tug of war on where to lean and where to pull. What's worth my time, what's not, when to stay and when to go. It's a gray area that I've had to work through, and I know others have as well, trying something new taking a risk, sharing their art with the world, going down a path with a high probability of failure. You know, when maybe we think we've found our song and we're singing and we're singing, but no one seems to hear. That's when the status quo has never looked so tempting, so ideal. When settling for the easy path has never seemed so appealing. No, never as appealing as when our songs seem to get lost in the ether. We know how hard it is to give a piece of ourselves to the world, and it seems odd not to get something back. But you know, I think this is when you must sing with all your heart and soul. Just like that songbird, indifferent to life below the branches of its tree. Well, so should you be to the factors existing outside the realm of what's best for you. It's not easy to uncover what makes you feel alive. And when you find that, live it. Own it, sing it at the top of your lungs, because it may seem like it's falling on deaf ears. But you just might be someone else's songbird, oblivious, like my feathered friend outside, to the beauty you are creating by just being you. By sharing what means the most to you with a world that, whether you realize it or not, needs to hear your song. So songbird, sing. Yeah, for you, but also for the world. You're right where you need to be. Sure, you have your doubts. Perhaps you feel tired, alone, fearful. Maybe you're trying to make sense of a world that feels too complex. Where all you see and hear are reasons to turn back, to find shelter, to run. Don't. Regardless, of how hard it seems, don't. You are right where you need to be, turning thoughts to things, making life from dreams, what makes change so interesting, so powerful yet deceptive, is that it comes to us in small doses. Not a tidal wave of transformation, but a slow, steady, rising tide of progress. No one feels the tug of erosion, yet it chips away. And so do you. Removing piece by piece the old you, the world you're moving away from, and piece by piece, you unveil the promise of your becoming. You may not see the whole picture, You may not understand the whole story, but right now, in real time, it's being told. And you are right where you need to be. 
We just weren't equipped to understand what that looks like. It's never been what you see that makes you uneasy. It's what's missing. That's what hurts. The solutions you wanted, the changes you expected, the finish lines you envisioned. It's the wondering, how long must I wait? Did I make a wrong turn? Is the joke on me? But it's this line of questioning that causes so many to stop. Unaware of how close they were, ignorant to the foundation they were standing on. What you need is not a miracle. It's to simply carry on to keep laying those bricks because not a one is wasted. And sometimes you don't realize you're on the 80th floor until you look down. That climb can be frustrating, exhausting. It isn't always glamorous, but it's necessary. And strength comes from understanding that truth. You are right where you need to be. The world, it can't take what you refuse to give it, and self-belief is non-negotiable. It's off the table, your most prized possession. So hold it tight, because it'll be needed when the journey feels long and the road impossible. You'll know that you can always take one step forward, and that is the essence of life, of growth, of progress. Think about the steps the lessons, the self-discovery that led you to this intersection of now and forever. This beginning of whatever you decide comes next. You are right where you need to be because you are armed with the decisions that brought you to today and the courage to let them carry you into tomorrow. You could be anywhere, but you're here. And as you strap up and settle in, You'll see that right here is everything you need. When it comes to the almost 8 billion people on planet Earth, There's undoubtedly a variance in the resources at our disposal, the influence we have. What we all share is the ability to rule over our own lives, our own thoughts. As Thoreau said, think for yourself or others will think for you without thinking of you. See, life moves quickly. And if one is unable to slow it down, to examine the world around them, well, they'll find themselves a cog in the wheel of their own existence, a pawn on the chessboard of life. Because reality is a battle, a battle of self-interest that requires that we build walls around that which is precious, that we protect it at all costs. Your worldview is the foundation for everything of value in your life, yet, It's constantly under attack. Attack from the negativity at the gate, the suffering attempting to breach the walls, the outside influences praying that you'll outsource your thinking, that you'll let them rule from afar. To maintain control over your own outlook, it's no small feat. It's perhaps the most important battle of your life. It's the difference between intentionality and chance. The role of the ruler or the ruled. As the saying goes, if you don't build your dream, you will spend your days building someone else's. If you don't ask yourself what you want in life, those needs will ultimately be buried under nonsensical obligation that takes their place where there are vacuums in awareness that you will be filled, usually not by actors with the same interests as you. See, mistakes are not the problem. No, mistakes mean you're present, driving towards something, collecting data for this experiment that is life. It's autopilot that destroys. Like that frog 
put in a pot heating up so slowly it never knows to jump out. The external world becomes its demise. And this message isn't to instill fear or intimidate, it's to remind you to ask the question that so few ask. How is my life best lived and what can I do to bring that to reality? If you can think for yourself, you're never out of the fight. If you can think for yourself, you're always a decision away from advancement in the direction of that which matters most. So trust you to do what's right for you. In a world where no one knows what they're doing, I can assure you, you don't need external endorsements or stamps of approval. Take Robert Frost's road less traveled by and don't look back, don't feel remorse. That's where you're forced to find yourself, to ask the tough questions, to embrace who you are. Because the crowd is antithetical to rationality. Not just because responsibility dissipates. Not just because human beings become essentially well-dressed chimpanzees, but because rarely on the micro level is the collective goal your goal. Have the courage to see that. Have the courage to understand that life is not an instruction manual. Everything around you, you have in one way or another accepted. And in accepting it, you have chosen it. By not saying no, you have in fact said yes. So realize that the world around you doesn't change until your thoughts become the bridge that connects current to future, today to tomorrow. Until you realize life can't make you a victim or a pawn on its chessboard without your permission, whether implicitly or explicitly. No, you have the ability to think, control, orchestrate something greater than what's in front of you. Let today be your next courageous step in the direction of that reality. Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. There's a distinct difference between today and tomorrow, the real and the so-called imagined. One has already been created and the other is in desperate need of a creator. And see, until we learn that we can be proactive in this regard, imagination doesn't mean much. It's just a car without wheels, plane without wings. It's more of an escape than a bridge to something better. But once we realize how much control we have over tomorrow, we become, in our own right, creators. Not just waiting to read and react to stories already written and handed down to us, but possessing this incredible ability to pick up a pen and craft something new. Become agents of change. I recently came across an interesting article. It had some info that, that made me think. Basically, it said if you take some domesticated animals like pigs or chickens and you place them back into the wild, some of their previously repressed uh, biological tendencies come right back into play. So for example, chickens change their breeding habits, how they take care of their eggs, pigs regrow their hair and that mane going down their back, and these old, repressed, kind of hidden away genes are reselected for again over time. And uh, the animals begin to reacclimate as though that potential was never lost. It just needed to immerse itself in the right environment. And it's like 
Well, if we view ourselves in that same light, now we might ask, what if we positioned ourselves to gravitate towards an environment that was best for us? What if I imagined a world, not exactly like today, but one better conducive to me being me? A world where I'm set up to thrive. Where sure there will be bumps and bruises and losses and lessons along the way, but where I'm immersed in a journey towards a destination that excites me, that lights me up. Can I find the courage to not only imagine that finish line, but also act accordingly, move towards it? You know, I always say the hardest thing to do is to recreate outcomes that look different from the current moment. Because while the current moment is all we know, it's all anybody knows. And by the way, it's all anybody wants to know, right? Until something new is placed right in front of them at their feet, until proof exists. Changing your life or the lives of those around you means you have to literally look at the road before you and see outcomes that are not there. Then you have to believe in those outcomes. You have to drive towards those outcomes, have conviction in your ability to overcome obstacles on your way to those outcomes. Truth be told, chasing your imagination is simultaneously one of the greatest burdens one can endure, as well as a key to that which makes life worth living. There's something about being human that pushes us towards hope, towards the possibility of a tomorrow better than today. And that's not to say, don't be grateful. It's not saying don't see the beauty around you or appreciate the world you live in. But I believe we're here to take that torch from yesterday and move it one step forward. Maybe it's in our own lives a small step forward in our careers, a relationship, or our health. Maybe it's improving the lives of those around us, family, friends. Maybe it's something larger, societal. Whatever it is, I'm convinced that true meaning in life is finding the courage to push one foot further down the path of possibility to add one step to that ascending staircase, knowing that it will allow us to someday look back on today and be proud of what we faced and overcame. And as I wake up and, and I look around, I think to myself, that has to mean cherishing the ideas in our heads. It has to mean we understand the power of our instincts, of our beliefs, of hope. It means understanding that it justifies all the hardship that comes with taking those ideas and giving them life. Because everything around us was built with the courage to take little nothings and make them something. And when we're lost or feel alone or for one reason or another forget that, we need to remember that right now is not forever. It can't be. It's a stepping stone to whatever you decide tomorrow is. And that goal isn't perfection. You don't need all the answers. You need the courage to take one little step in a new direction, to write just one sentence on a brand new page because that imagination is not fiction. It's not the delta between the possible or impossible. It's not there to entertain. It's there because it's your map. And you may look at that map and think to yourself, you're lost. That it's unclear that the directions, well, they're incomplete at best. But what I can promise you is the pursuit of this world you've imagined 
It will bring you greater satisfaction than anything else could. It will remind you why you're here and show you that life isn't supposed to be easy while helping you appreciate it for being that way. See, your imagination is your path to that ideal state where you can thrive. Be you, push your boundaries and spread your wings. Don't ever let the current state of today convince you that your hopes and your dreams for tomorrow are too big. That you've missed the mark or stepped out of the line. In a world of reaction, be one of the few who looks in the mirror and decides to live life proactively, take initiative. Be one of the few who stands wholeheartedly behind that world they've imagined. Life is delicate, defined as easily broken or damaged, fragile. There's nothing around you that's forever. There's no permanence in our world, and sometimes it's a difficult thing to grasp. Certainly, it's why we long for patterns of consistency where we can find them. We do everything we can to manufacture some semblance of predictability for as long as we can. Doing our best to repress the idea that everything we know is as temporary as a setting sun. I had a family member uh, rush to the ER a few days ago. And thank God she's completely fine. She's back home, she's doing her thing. But I can't stop thinking about the call, how it shook me to my core, how my walls of certainty and predictability were breached. It was this unsettling reminder that life as we know it isn't guaranteed, that things we love, they're not untouchable. I had to look my helplessness in the face for the first time in a while and realize, well, just how little of the world is mine to control. Which brings me back to a conversation I had when I was younger. Um, I talk about my grandfather often in my work, primarily because of uh, a few impactful conversations that we had. And it's interesting to me how relevant they continue to be. I remember a handful of times we talked from childhood and it's like I piece them together retroactively. Things make sense as I get older and kind of figure out what it all means. In one of my last conversations with him, we went to this little diner called Leo's along the Cape Cod Canal. And he said to me, there are things now that seem impossible. But as you grow and you get older, they make sense, right? Even the most challenging things become manageable. And I get mad at myself for not understanding the context at the time or putting two and two together. But basically, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor and he knew what that meant, right? And was, was basically giving me a heads up like, kiddo, this is going to be tough but hang in there. And that was one of the first times I've dealt with loss of that magnitude, right? And when you're young, so many things seem stable. They seem certain. You don't yet get the fluidity of life. That stream is moving and no matter what, it's going to continue to move. Sometimes that means it takes you places and presents realities that overtake the map that you created for the world, what you understood, what you hoped for. That little understanding of what life means. And I guess I wanted to pick up the baton from that conversation and, and pass it on to you with maybe a more comprehensive viewpoint. Because I think contained in those words is a message so powerful, so important, that we really can't afford to miss it. It's like, yes, life is unpredictable. And yes, life can hurt and humble us and knock down what we thought was certain. It can challenge what we believed and shake our foundations. 
It can make us feel small in a universe that stretches beyond comprehension. But at the very center of all of that, we are equipped with something that can't be broken. The only thing that can't be ripped away, the sun around which everything else revolves, your ability to endure, your strength to carry on, to take one step forward. Whether it feels like you're entrenched in the depths of hell or swinging from the stars in the sky. Your resilience, your ability to not only handle life around you, but rise from the ashes of its turbulence and its misfortune, that will never leave you if you don't let it. Viktor Frankl has said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. See, life might be more than we can control or comprehend, but amidst the might and power of its ocean, our determination is unsinkable. And believe me, there are times when you hear this and think, well, okay, that doesn't affect me. I'm good. I'm doing my thing, right? Just like I did sitting at that table over eggs and bacon that morning. And man, I hope that's the case and I hope it stays that way. But life has a way of keeping us on our toes. It never lets us stray too far from the realization that to be human is in some way or another to suffer. It's inescapable and that's not to scare you, it's to remind you that one, storms will come, and two, regardless of how heavy the rain falls or how loud the thunder roars, it will pass. And you are strong enough to hang on until it does that as you grow and as you evolve, you become more and more capable of seeing the inevitable, not as the world's personal vendetta against you, but as your time to dig deep and find within yourself the strength and the courage that was there all along. And that's what that morning was, a message that look, what's coming will hurt, but you, can handle it. And not only that, every time life brings you to your knees, you get back up stronger. That doesn't mean it's easy, but the point is not that it's supposed to be easy. It's that you're capable of handling a world that is not easy. You're capable of navigating a reality that is not simple, a sea that is not smooth sailing. You're equipped to handle the complex. And sometimes that little reminder is the greatest gift one can receive. There's so much I can't control, but my God, there's so much I can. The reality you have mapped out, the day-to-day, -day, the things you've come to know and rely on, as much as we wish they weren't, they are delicate. Withering away with time, susceptible to the intricacies, the trials and tribulations of life but your heart, your soul, your world within, that is untouchable. It's the divine, the sacred, it's strength limitless, it's breath endless. So remember, even in the darkest of times, you are the very light you long for. And as long as you believe that, there will always be a path. In the midst of chaos, there's also opportunity. That's a quote from Sun Tzu, referencing the idea that when we are backed into a corner of some sort, or when we are low, when we're vulnerable, when we're at our worst, that's when the door opens to transform, right? And we talk about this all the time, right? There's, there's, 
I can give you an infinite amount of videos on this channel talking about moving into uh, fear, that state of the unknown, breaking down what we know. And I think a lot of people hear that, um, but perhaps don't understand why. And that's why I wanted to make this video, because when I understood why, like so many things, my perspective changed. And this was a big one. It was big with regard to uh, how I saw my life, my role uh, in, in, you know, the trials and tribulations of the world. Why do one thing that scares you every day? Why do the difficult thing? Um, and the best explanation I've ever heard, I was listening to um, one of Jordan Peterson's online lectures. You know, he's talking about order and chaos, right? Our, our natural inclination, our understanding is that chaos equals bad, right? When we think chaos, we think moving pieces, we think, um, you know, disaster, uh, something we need to move away from. And that in itself, is the problem. That instinct or that, that rash, uh, you know, understanding. In reality, chaos is just as important as order. They are night and day. You can't have one without the other and you need both. Too much order is when we are stuck in a status quo, when there is a lack of of growth, when things are, are very structured, uh, very simple, and they just feel the same, right? We become accustomed to a certain truth. That is order. Chaos is, as I've said in the past, taking something, smashing it against a wall, picking up those pieces and building something new. And upon building, you've changed whatever that was just a little bit you've changed your understanding a little bit of yourself, of that object and of the world because life is a perpetual staircase. It is being on a step, stepping out into some crazy unknown where you no longer understand what is going on, leveling up, growing, figuring it out, picking those pieces up and then moving on to the next step. It is building and breaking and building and breaking and building and breaking. So why step out into the unknown? The unknown is the only way to break the status quo. The unknown is the door into a next level, a new you, a new reality. When you look at it, human beings want to bucket things into good or bad, right? And when the reality is most of the time, the truth and the value the reality is in the gray area, right? So when we think about the good times, you know, we think this is what we want. This is ideal. You know, things are, uh, are fluid. They're simple. But that is antithetical to change, right? Change comes from chaos. Just like when I thought things were going wrong, you know, my first thought was always, oh my God, the world's ending. This is not good. We need to find a way to, to, to completely mitigate this, to change the situation. Now, when the wheels fall off that metaphorical wagon, what I think is, well, here is the opportunity. Here's the opportunity to build that new step, to create a, a, a new order so that I can live my life differently. See, we don't level up unless the situation around us uh, requires that we do so. Sometimes uh, life doesn't give us a choice, right? Sometimes the world backs us into a corner, but there are a lot of situations where we need to manufacture that chaos. We need to drive that change, climb up that ladder. It's funny to think about, you know, some of those people that we emulate, that we look up to. And, you know, people don't talk about the risks that were taken and how many times they picked up their life, they picked up their status quo and smashed it with a hammer so that they could rebuild it. 
and, 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 and have something a little bit more sturdy, a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. That's how wisdom is created. You know, when I look at that cycle now, and I see it as the answer. You know, when I haven't had one of those calls or Zoom meetings or haven't created something, haven't, uh, you know, fill in the blank that, that gives me that feeling in my stomach of uh, at least some semblance of anxiety, I'm not growing, right? The things that gave me anxiety five years ago, uh, most of them are commonplace today, right? That chaos is very much order now. So what's going to be the new thing, right? That was the ceiling, now it's the floor. Well, what's the new ceiling? And that's on us to create. That onus is on us to build, right? Constructing a different world means reassembling the pieces. And so I want that message to be clear. I want everyone to understand that when someone says, uh, you know, what you want is on the other side of fear or keep going, don't give up. Well, why? The reason is, is because that chaos is your ticket to the next level, the next staircase. That anxiety and sometimes that suffering is a portal to transformation. And it's hard in the moment to, to understand that, you know, I'd never sit here and say it's easy, um, but you know me. And one of the things that changed my life is the understanding that the best things are not easy. The value is in what's difficult. The meaning is in that unknown. I think life is a beautiful thing because the pieces we need are everywhere around us. And it's a really cool realization. It's like everything you need exists. It's out there. It's waiting for you to pick it up. It's waiting, it'll correspond with the picture you want to paint, the road you want to take. but that requires stepping off the stage you're on and heading towards another. So I wanna leave you with that, that understanding that you are climbing a staircase to something greater, to an evolved self. You're taking your potential and you're making something with it. But that means you won't always be comfortable. And when you look back, you'll be grateful. Right? You'll be grateful for those, uh, those trials and tribulations. You'll be grateful for that chaos because it will be uh, what made you. What's one thing I wish I knew when I was younger that I think people could benefit from today? What single piece of information could have the biggest impact? And I spent some time thinking about this question and the more I think about it, the more the answer becomes incredibly apparent. It's that you are in control of your own life, your own destiny, your own future. And when you take accountability for yourself, life changes, period. And if you thought that was obvious, I would advocate taking a look around, maybe a stroll through social media, the Twitters and Instagrams and TikToks of today. And no, that's not the real world, but it's certainly a microcosm of the real world. What do you see? Well, you see chronic blame, I don't like where I'm at or things are, so that must be your fault or their fault or someone else's fault. You see people looking everywhere but in the mirror, actually seeking out victimhood. 
because that's what brings the attention. That's today's currency. It's much easier to be the victim than the hero because being the hero means you have to sacrifice something. It's people saying the news or some institution or the federal government is the problem. And if those things would only change, then we'd be good. Let me explain why I think this mentality is self-sabotage. And why I would take younger me by the hand and I would say, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Where you start is often outside of our control. Let's be real, life is not fair. We don't all get dealt the same hand. But this next part, as I once heard Will Smith articulate beautifully, is the same for everyone. What you decide to do about it right now is what matters. And that is the control that we all have. It's not your fault where you start, but it's your responsibility to choose where you end up. You can shake your fist at the sky, or you can start building a life that matters to you. It's easy to blame the world, to be the victim, at least in the short term. But a fulfilling life is about meaning, about fighting for something valuable, about evolving into the version of yourself that you always knew in your heart you could be. You just had to unlock. See, no one down the road was ever happy with themselves for blaming the world while they bitterly remained stagnant. I would say to a younger me, worry less about how you're perceived and think more about who you are, what you're capable of, because that you can always control. Stop losing yourself in the news or whatever the narrative of the day is. That has nothing to do with your progression has nothing to do with your very next step. So sure, be informed, but do more, consume less. Because by and large, it's a distraction. And I would say the government, which has become the crux of our discourse today, transforming into a modern day religion. Look, the government's job is not to give you anything. It's there to protect what's inherent to you already your right to live life on your terms. See, satisfaction, it will come from good habits. It will come from self-belief. It will come from taking risks and failing and learning. It will come from the courage to step out into a world that's completely unknown. It will never come from a self-interested politician or body in Washington, red or blue. So stop whining about political optics and focus on where your two feet are taking you right now. Because I promise in the grand scheme of things, that's what matters. That is your strength. Expecting someone else to come along and change your life is like screaming into an abyss. I would say to my younger self, when you start looking around and seeing what everyone else has, and beating yourself up for not being as good or feeling like you're behind. Look, it's great that their success motivates you, but dwelling on it won't make your life better. Life is a race between you and you. It's a fight between yourself and those thoughts that constantly knock on the door, looking to settle into your psyche. If you defeat that demon, you'll be where you want to be, regardless of where others are. You're right where you need to be, so keep your head up and keep moving forward. I'd explain that to become something more, to change, requires a sacrifice that feels so substantial, so big at first, that it bullies most people into staying right where they are. That to become something new, you have to learn to play the fool, to get humbled, you have to change your relationship with short-term failure. And that's not easy. But taking control of your life is not supposed to be easy. Only worth it. They're different. And I can certainly look back at my own life 
think about the times where I was so busy pointing out that I didn't even think to point the finger at myself. I was so worried about life being unfair that I existed in this temporary state of paralysis. The whole time not knowing that I could have been stepping forward. Could have been tapping into the single greatest power I possess, control over my own life. See, every time you feel anger or the need to blame those around you, you're taking the spotlight off of what matters and placing it on things detrimental to where you want to be, to your journey and your future. Even the most unjust, arbitrary things, let's say you didn't get that promotion you were beyond qualified for, or you were mistreated by someone or things didn't go the way you wanted them to, you can fill in that blank, but refusing to blame others and immediately taking responsibility. Again, even in a situation like that, it gives you one of the greatest advantages in life. It gives you that gift of control. You can now assess the situation. You can now ask yourself, hey, what can I do to change this? You can delve into the why, find the lessons and the value. You can come back and reapproach this thing stronger. Because to blame others, to take on that role of victim, it's essentially living life in the passenger seat. It might be easier, might be less work, less responsibility, but what you never have is control over where that car goes. But when you own it, when you say, hey, maybe it's not my fault, but look, it's mine now. It's my responsibility, the good, the bad, every aspect of my life. It puts you in position to change things, to take the wheel and reroute to a destination of your choosing. So that would be my message to the world. I know it's not an easy road. I know life is unfair. I know things aren't perfect, but the best thing you can ever do for yourself is say, you know what, this is mine to own. And I'm going to look around for that light switch that will create momentum. That little decision that will get the ball rolling. I'm not going to sit back, shake my fist and blame life. I'm going to walk out that door and create life. That's where you'll find what you're truly looking for. Every once in a while, for a brief moment in time, we need to pause. We need to take a breath and ask ourselves who we are. Of course, not in the literal sense, not the reflection staring back in the mirror, but in the context of the road you've already traveled, how far you've come. Because it's easy to become consumed with what's ahead, especially when you can start to feel that finish line. You can see the top of the mountain. When you know everything is about to be on the line, your greatest test awaits. But here's one of the greatest secrets I've ever been told. That test is not about right now. It's not even about the future. It's about the foundation you've already been building and trusting yourself to be you. It's all those times you could have said no, but you didn't. How you, like so many others, could have taken that easy road, but you opted for something greater. No, my friend, this obstacle before you is not where you prove or make or create yourself. It's where you simply verify who you already are. Cash in on a prize that's been years in the making. It's where you validate the price you've been paying for as long as you can remember. And what you need to take with you, what you need to understand right now more than any other time is that you aren't here to simply survive or navigate foreign territory. No, you, you were made for this moment. 
There's a saying that pain is temporary, but quitting is forever. And that simple quote has got me through some of life's greatest trials and tribulations, most challenging times. Because to put it simply, when we're overwhelmed or we're amidst life's chaos, our minds don't scream out, oh, hey, you've gotten through this before and you'll get through it again. They don't remind us of our strengths or reassure us of our dedication. No, when we feel like we are neck deep in chaos, all we see is what we're not. That's why people quit. They become consumed with the dark, forgetting that the answer is a light switch away, overlooking the fact that they already have everything they need. So let this be your reminder that getting across the finish line doesn't require some miracle, doesn't require you to do what no one in humanity has ever done before. No, all it asks is that you believe in yourself to hang on when others would let go, to continue forward when you most want to turn back, because it's always darkest before the dawn, most challenging at the peak when the roar of the crowd becomes audible and the trophy visible. Find it within yourself to rise amidst the pressure, not to shrink, but to expand, to be the most powerful person in your life, you. Because right now, in this moment, you have arrived. Years from now, when you look back, make sure you remember one thing about this moment. That you gave everything you had. That you leaned in on those late nights and those early morning wake-ups. The hours upon hours in the books, the preparation, dedication, and the resilience. That you knew who you were and let it manifest and lead you into the future. See, we all find ourselves at this fork in the road. The one where we have a decision to make. Will I survive or will I thrive? Will I exist or will I truly live? And in the race of life, it's when our hearts pound in our chest. The blood flows through our veins, our lungs cry out for air, our minds beg us to stop, slow down, relax. It's in that moment that we must carry on, we must be our best, we must put all those little pieces together to create our masterpiece, to breathe life into the foundation that you have been standing on this whole time. See, this moment is yours. If you're willing to endure, to hang in just a little bit longer, give just a little bit more, if you're willing to put all of yourself into the task before you, you may just be amazed at what life gives back. There are always footsteps behind you. It's an idea I talked about years ago. And it stemmed from a quote from Mark Cuban, he says, look, you need to be working 24 seven like there is someone constantly around the clock working to take it all away from you. And I strongly believe in that notion. I think there's a lot of value in that understanding. It's, it's a way to help you level up, right? Because the idea is in life, in the world we live in, there is no cap on what we can be doing. And short of driving yourself crazy, there's value in the understanding that uh, the, the, the place you arrived at, the place you said, all right, I did my best, that was my limit, that was the peak, 
Maybe it was extraordinary. Maybe it was progress. But it was not your maximum. Why? Because that word means nothing. As it, it, when when uh, used in the context of human potential, it's an infinite thing. You can't put a finger on someone's maximum, on someone's limit, on someone reaching their full potential. It's an arbitrary number, right? And so that was the idea. Long story short, I was running and, and I, I would run around the Charles River in Boston and I would really excite myself. I would get worked up and, and, and force myself to dig deep when I saw, you know, someone run by me or, or, or even the idea that someone would. It helped me, uh, you know, when I wasn't feeling my best to suck it up and, and push myself. And so there was value there, no question. But I had an epiphany the other day, as I was, you guessed it, running. And it's related to the, the, the concept in The Sound of Footsteps. And I'm not sure if, if it's a parallel idea, maybe a progression, or maybe it's the result of five years, six years since writing that, immersed in the world of entrepreneurship and speaking and, and you know, being a creator uh, on YouTube and on these platforms, you learn a lot about yourself. And this particular situation helped me realize that. It was a, I was doing a nine mile run down A1A in South Florida, which is, it's one of my favorite uh, places to run because it's just straight shot, you know, straight up. You don't have to think, uh, you can just one foot in front of the other and, uh, you know, I I enjoy the run. And as I've been, you know, working my way back into running shape, coming back from an injury, it's been beautiful. And so I'm a, a few miles into this run. And sure enough, someone blows by me. Uh, probably going at a five and a half, six minute pace, right? And my first instinct is, whoa, Ed, time to level up, man. What are you doing? Like, that's not even close, right? Sound of footsteps. Someone was behind you. Someone's working harder. Someone's going faster. There they go. Here you are. And then I had this realization, a very common sense realization. You're gonna see that dude and pass him a mile up the road. Because unless he is an incredible athlete, that's not maintainable. Um, you know, you are going at a slower pace, but you're going further and you will pass him. And then I had a second thought, which was who the hell cares? You know, the, the sort of old notion that the speed of others is some way related to you can be troubling, right? And again, there is no right or wrong, left or right, good or bad. The world exists in this, in this gray area. And I believe that if you can find value in something, utilize it. If you're someone that gets motivated by that type of thing, sometimes I am, a lot of the time I am, um, you know, green light, use it. But I think that highlighted a trap that I've fallen into, that I think a lot of us fall into. We hear those footsteps. We see that six minute miler go by us. And we think it's somehow reflective of us in our journey or correlated to where we're going or says something about us. When in reality, it means nothing. Like there, there's a, there's a, <laughs> it's comical that I'm sitting here even talking about it right now, right? Because the, the, the relationship between my goals and his goals are, are nil, none. But that's the world we live in, right? That's the social media world of highlight reels, of seeing people's six minute sprints and saying, oh my God, I'm running it at eight and a half. It's like, yeah, well, one, he went one mile, you're going nine. Two, you're running different races. Three, your finish line is all that matters. And 
it really hit home because in this maybe six year stretch, the biggest mistakes I've made, and I never shy away from admitting this, they're when I had that sense of panic and anxiety due to other people talking about things that work for them, their success. This is the way to get what you want. Look what I did. Look how I achieve A, B, and C. You want the answer? Here's the answer. Then I'd look in the mirror and I'd think, well, hell, I'm going slower than this. I'm not, I'm not there, right? I'm not doing what they're doing. And they had a little bit of success there, right? Better change my plan, better pivot, better integrate uh, you know, their steps, their processes. And that's always when I get in trouble. That's always when I have to take a step back and, and say, Ed, what are you? This is not you. You had a plan. You had a finish line. You had an idea that you believed in. And now what, what are you doing? Right? And I'd have to reel it back in. And this happened a few times, right? Because sometimes it's not as obvious. Sometimes you forget your value, what you're giving to the world and what you love to do, right? If you're going down a highway, there are a lot of exits. There are a lot of people saying, this is where you need to get off. This is where, you know, your answers are. This is what he or she did and look how successful they are. That's the exact same thing as looking at that guy speeding down A1A at a six minute mile pace and feeling any level of inadequacy. What he's doing and where he's going is not what you're doing and it's not where you're going. And so I had a, uh, I had a lot of time to have a conversation with myself, uh, but that's exactly what I did. I had a tough conversation with myself. You've changed. You've changed since you wrote that speech and that's a beautiful thing because my friend, if you're not changing, you're not learning, you are dying. And there's a time and a place again for everything. Yeah, if you're looking around and everyone's working harder than you, hey, maybe that's an indicator. Maybe you need to ask yourself the question, what am I capable of? Am I pushing myself in that direction? Or have I accepted some type of mediocrity? Right? But, but they are not you. And in today's world, I want you to remember that because most of our interactions, they are digital. They are curated snippets, pictures, videos, concepts that are just not reflective of reality, especially online, right? I've, I've been able to see the, the curtain pulled back on, on so many things and it's like nothing is what it seems to be. People are not who they claim they are, right? And this is not some conspiracy that like there's all these strings being pulled in the background. But what I'm saying is no one presents life as it is. They present life as they want it to be seen. And the difference between those two things is substantial, I promise. And so when you are looking to your left, you're looking to your right, you're comparing it to yourself and you feel any level of inadequacy, Remember that you are going down a road that is valuable, that means something to you. You have your finish line and you're going to get there. Don't be misguided, um, you know, by these, these, these short half mile sprints or whatever they are. Don't be misguided, don't, don't be distracted by anything but where you're going. Because I promise, if you just move forward, if you believe in your pursuit and trust yourself to get there, if you're willing to adapt and grow, if you're aware enough to understand that you'll make mistakes, you'll learn from them and you'll pick up the pieces, the only adversary you have is yourself. Nothing else matters. So let's get that finish line. There's often a vast distinction 
between what we think is holding us back and what is actually holding us back. And that may even be putting it lightly. Most of the time, we're just plain misinformed. Most of the time, we're looking externally at irrelevant discrepancies between ourselves and someone else. We're looking at things that happened yesterday, possible outcomes that may happen tomorrow. We're creating entire stories, crafting narratives, building hostile worlds that simply don't exist. When what we need is simple, to give ourselves permission to let ourselves walk out that front door and towards what we long for. And this came to light recently. I, I shared a, a simple 20 second message on TikTok where uh, basically I highlighted John Green's quote about the best things in life occurring after we find the courage to depart or leave where we are, right? To build again. And as I was looking at the response, it was both beautiful and eye-opening. Hundreds and hundreds of comments from people saying that the message helped them feel empowered to do what they've been putting off. And some called it fate. Some called it what they needed to hear at the exact moment they needed to hear it. And as I'm going through, I, I, I keep thinking the same thing over and over and over. Every single one of these people they already knew in their hearts what needed to come next. They knew what would make them feel alive. They knew where the compass was pointing. Yet their default led them to the same place we've all been, waiting for external permission, waiting for life to give us a reason to say, okay, the light is now green. You can go. The time is right. Now, don't get me wrong. It means the world that a simple message can shift one's perspective that way. I've been on the receiving end. I was stuck looking for some type of guidance. We all have, but I think we'd all agree that if that guidance helps us get back on track, then the real question should be, how do we live so that we can stay to the best of our ability on track? Find ourselves less prone to those occurrences, more confident in ourselves, in our dreams, in where we're going. And for me, it's been understanding that in my life, I am the one that creates, signs, and sends the permission slips. I say go. And when I remember that, I'm free to do what's best for me. I'm simultaneously the architect and the pieces, the wind and the sail. See, you don't need a reason to walk out of a relationship you're not happy in. You don't need a reason to leave a job that's not pushing you to be who you most want to become. You don't need a reason to change a habit or reinvent yourself or begin again. No, all you need is the courage to green light what your heart already knows it wants. We think that the external world has the answers for us. When in reality, we've had them the whole time. We just want something to point to, to say, see, I was right. But we don't need to be reactive. We can be proactive. You can be the one that lights the fire. When you follow your intuition, your heart, your sense of purpose, life conforms because it has to conform. When you become an immovable object, Life around you moves, it makes way, and if it doesn't, then you go back to the drawing board, you adapt and adjust. 
And that's the beauty of life. That's how we build meaning, trusting ourselves to walk into that resistance. Because the friction and the headwind is never what's holding us back. Are they uncomfortable? Yeah. At times, does it scare us? Sure. It's supposed to. But it's not what holds you back. Waiting for someone or something to come along and green light your journey through life is what holds you back. And it's funny, I think we again and again overlook the simplest of truths. The hardest part is starting. It's convincing yourself that one, it's possible, and two, you're worth it. Everything else you face from the second you walk out that front door can be conquered. In fact, we ourselves grow along the way so that we can rise up and meet the demands of life, but it's unquestionably doable. That thought as you look out the window, right? What if the worst case scenario happens? It can't. Because the worst case scenario is sitting in that seat your whole life, looking out the window and imagining a world where you found the courage to be more, to explore, to live life as it was meant to be lived. But let's say, let's say that what we fear does come to fruition. Then I ask, what are the odds it's reversible? Probably high. Let's say I want to start a podcast and I finally work up the courage and I get my mic and I start my show and no one listens. But I keep going and I keep going and nothing sticks. And most importantly, I learn, look, I'm really not crazy about this idea. It wasn't what I thought it was. It's not me. Okay, perfect. Now you know. And sure, it took time to learn that lesson, but you have the rest of your life to continue the beautiful experiment to search for what lights you up. But you found the courage to explore, to try, to begin, and you are now better because of it. That's your worst case scenario? Sounds a lot less scary to me than a life lived sitting there looking out the window. See, we can't let the fear of an unlikely worst case stop the possibility of that oh-so-coveted best case. Don't let the virtually 0% probability of losing everything overshadow the opportunity to gain everything. Let's never allow ourselves to get caught standing still waiting for the universe to give us the answer as though we're waiting for a letter in the mail. No, give yourself permission to see the upside, to make your own decisions, and most importantly, to live your life.